this morning. Let's get ready to worship our Lord and Savior today. Please pray with me. As we lift up your name, may your kingdom come and your will be done. I honor you, Father, and offer you my very best in praise. Pour out your spirit while I sing, pray, and learn from your word a more excellent way. Let us come together as one and worship Christ, our risen Lord. Hallelujah.
Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. But still in your hands, this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail me yet. You never fail me yet. And I never.
Hey, you know, I was just kind of thinking, if we're singing the song about the power of the name of Jesus, the most powerful name ever spoken under heaven. In fact, the scripture says that there is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. That's the name of Jesus. I think we just need to shout that out a little bit today. I think we need to let that go a little bit. Come on, I want you just to shout in your outdoor voice. Just shout out the name of Jesus, will you, for me real quick. Come on, now let's clap our hands and bless the name of the Lord today. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day. Would you do me a favor? Would you, uh, you know, and, and it's okay if you kind of get across the aisle, but, you know, I try to rein this, this group. Once you release this group, it's, it just gets crazy. But why don't you go around and just tell somebody, I'm so in love with Jesus, and I'm so happy to see you today. So in love with Jesus. So happy to see you today. Tanya, Ruby, can I, can you join me up here, please? Come on. Everybody loves the Lord today. Say amen. amen. Hey, you may be seated. I just want to take a moment to, um, I want to take a moment to uh, talk about these two lovely ladies up here. Can everybody say, hi, Tanya, hi, Ruby. Wow, what a great morning. This really is a special morning for the McLaughlin family. Two years ago on Easter, Terry, Terry, would you stand? In fact, come on up here. Why don't you bring Reed and come on. I know you guys are wearing your best ball caps today, and I'm happy with that. That's good. Yeah. This is a wonderful family. And uh, gosh, I, I had the, the honor and privilege of serving you uh, over your wedding. How many years ago? 15 years. 15 years ago. Man, you haven't gained a pound since then, my friend. You look fantastic. You look fantastic. Now this guy's catching you. Yeah, he's right behind you. Yeah. Now two years ago on Easter, Resurrection Sunday, you guys were baptized. Yeah. And now today, Miss Ruby has made this decision because she has come to the place in her faith that she realizes and acknowledges that Christ is the choice of her life the choice of her heart. <laughs> and because of that choice, she has prepared herself for baptism today. And I got a little text from this beautiful lady right here who I have been knowing since you were this age right here. And I haven't aged at all, at, at, at all. I <laughs> yes, but the truth is um, that... Uh, uh, I got a text from you this, this first part of the week, and you said, you know, it's been so many, so many years when I was little when I was baptized, and would it be inappropriate to be baptized again? And I didn't have the heart to say that, hey, when I was a teenager, I, I got baptized every year at camp. I, you know, and didn't, I was like, it didn't work. Can I do it again? You know, I mean, there was a couple years it was in the lake, and I just swam off after it was over, you know. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that I texted her back and I said, it's entirely appropriate. This is a legacy moment for your family. These are the moments that you don't let go by. These are the moments that you don't let slip through your fingers without acknowledging, without celebrating, and without calling everybody that means anything together and saying, we're going to baptize today. And we're going to make a statement of faith. Mom, daughter, father, son. This is who we are. This is who we are. We're the McLaughlin family, and we're people of faith, and we love Jesus. So I would like for you guys to go over and support the girls, okay? And look at here. Look who gets to baptize today. Yeah. Papa Mike. So, amen.
guys go ahead. Thank you. Now, we've already talked about Ruby's profession of faith. So we, need, we don't need to cover that again, but I want you just to lift up your heads to the Lord today with me. Father, we are so grateful today that Ruby has made this choice to make you her Lord and King. Choice of her heart, choice of her life. And her grandfather, Mike, baptizes her now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Let's give the Lord a praise. Wow. And Tanya, I don't know. I baptized your brothers in the ocean at Catalina Island at sunset. Were you part of that group that got baptized over there? You were. Okay. You know what? I, I don't have any sunset for you, but I do have the cold water. Yeah. But I am so happy, Tanya, for you. As you lead your family, you and Terry lead your family in faith as believers and followers of Christ. And you set that example for your children, for Reed, for Ruby today. I know that your father is so honored and proud to be baptizing you now in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord another praise today. Move the mountain. You move the mountain. Hallelujah. That's exciting. This is a great day. I'm so glad you've joined us for worship. Obviously, when you came in and things were a little bit different, I know that some of you are still trying to decide whether you're mad at me or not because your normal seat is gone and I moved it on you. Okay. Well, we've got communion. You have an opportunity to ask the Lord to forgive you for being so mad at me for the first 15 minutes of worship. I promise your seat will be back where it was next week. But we are celebrating... This Sunday and for the rest of the month, we are celebrating 20 years of ministry at Reunion Church. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it is fitting that we have the tables and chairs because we started at picnic tables at Rose Mofford Park in April of 1999. We were there for four weeks. It got so hot on us that we said we got to get a building. So we got a building across the street at Black Canyon Convention Center. We were there for two years. But on May 10th, Mother's Day, 1999, we celebrated our first indoor service. And we baptized, we, we uh, dedicated children, we had communion, and I gave a really short sermon. And we celebrated our first, uh, our first official Sunday as the reunion community, and that was 20 years ago on the 10th. And so today we celebrate, and we are so glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to be sharing a meal together, which is another rich tradition of the reunion community. Sharing, breaking bread together. We love God. We teach His truth. We care for one another in fellowship. Say it with me. Fellowship, communion prayer. And I'm praying that we have another 20 years unless Jesus decides to come back, and I would like for him to do that. I really would. But if he doesn't, reunion's going to be here, reaching out, loving God, loving people, spreading the message and the love of Jesus Christ, discipling, training, praying. I'm really glad that you're here today. We'd love to have you stay around and have a meal with us. No cost. It's Cinco de Mayo, so we're having Mexican food. I got a little woo-woo, that's it. Where's all my Italians? Come on now. This is going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, yesterday, I heard that uh, there was a great turnout. We had uh, Daughter of the King Ball here yesterday. 
and uh, I heard it was just a wonderful turnout. And I, I understand that, uh, that Adam Rogers' uh, daughter began her uh, official singing career yesterday. Uh, here, at, you know, daughter of the King Ball. So um, I, guess, I guess there's that. So you got to start writing music for her and get her an agent. And yeah. Hey, man, this is 2019. This is what we do now. You know, we got to remember, our kids are great and everybody gets a trophy. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. God is so good. God is so good. Wow. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we're just going to prepare our hearts just together around these tables. This invitation of grace that you give us each week never ceases to amaze us. It's almost unfathomable sometimes, Father, when we step back and realize that everything you see and everything you know about us, and yet you still choose us. You choose us in our moments where we're on our very best and you choose us in those moments even more readily when we're at our worst. We are so grateful for that grace. All we can do is respond and follow you. Please pray with me. Most merciful God, we give thanks for your grace and for victory over sin and condemnation through Christ Jesus. Forgive us in those times when what we think, say, or do is not pleasing to you. We want to love you with our whole heart, to love our neighbors or ourselves. We're sorry when we do not. To you, Lord, we surrender the pride of life, and we ask your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. We pray your will be done and not our own. Holy Spirit, guide us into truth for the glory of your name. Everybody says, Amen. My prayer is that the Lord would be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let's give thanks to the Lord our God because it is a good thing that we should at all times, all places, give thanks to the Lord. So today we join with the host of heaven, a cloud of witnesses, to praise, to magnify His glorious name, declaring, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, and glory to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. What an opportunity we have today to remember that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, and that Christ has promised to come again. Can you say amen? Now, these are... This is our hope, and I hope today that you are filled with that promise. So by invitation of Christ, not by invitation of reunion, not by invitation of pastor who's wearing the shirt with cufflinks, by invitation of Jesus, do you know him? Do you know him? He knows you. <laughs> By his invitation, he says to us, come. Come on, reunion. Come on, friends. Come, let's gather in the name of Christ. Let's come for communion. Let's gather. Let's bring our tithes, our offerings. But more than anything, let's bring our heart to love and to worship and honor our King Jesus today. change to
still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, Lord, you've never failed. You're still enough. Mm, keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, oh, oh. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faith I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. Hey, if you're a visitor today, we welcome you. We're so thrilled to have you. There's a lot of wonderful, wonderful churches uh, on the west side of, of Phoenix, in Glendale, Peoria, a lot of wonderful churches, dynamic churches. And we like to think that we are one of those dynamic and wonderful churches. This church has the ability to love like no other. This, ha this church has the ability to serve like any other church I've ever seen in my life. This is a strong and a dynamic community built with a great cross-section of people from young couples to uh, younger couples like myself and V, right? And uh, I just wanted to say to you that we are thrilled that you're here visiting with us today. And if you have any questions about our worship or anything like that, take a moment to, uh, to stop by and shake my hand before you get out of here today. And um, I'm sure that we can answer most of the questions that you have. And uh, I promise that if you open your heart to reunion, reunion has already opened its heart to you. And we're thrilled that you're here. So, will you pray with me the way the Lord has taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise again. So I wanted to say thank you to our kids for being a part of our worship, and it is one of the highlights of my week to be able to worship with our children, uh, at least for the greater portion of our Sunday morning, and I hope everyone understands that it's by choice that our kids are in here with us. It's intentional. Um, we have always believed not that we're right and everybody else is wrong, but we have always believed in our heart that our children learn how to worship from us. And there are wonderful people that God brings into our kids' lives to teach 
uh, to provide opportunities for growth, um, interaction, social development, more than anything else, opening up our children's heart to the possibilities of Jesus Christ in their life. And we are grateful for that, but more than anything else, our children in their most formative years need to see their parents worshiping the Lord. They need to see their kids. The kids need to see their parents with their hands raised, their hearts open. Our children need to see us pray a prayer of faith. They need to hear those words of faith coming out of our mouth. They need to hear us calling out to God and asking for the mercy and the favor and the blessings of God. They need to hear that. They need to hear us sing, whether we can carry a tune or not. Our children need to hear us sing and worship the Lord. Children need to hear us and see us celebrate. Celebrate Christ. Our children need to see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Can you say amen? And that's why they're here. So, uh, I, I guess while I was talking, they all left on me. So, we're going to uh, continue uh, on with our series. Did, did our kids go already or no? Okay. All right. Hey, thanks for, thanks for understanding about not sitting at the round tables. And... Uh, um, I don't want anybody to accidentally uh, get that $500 that's taped under one of those chairs before church, during church, because then you'd have to tithe 50 bucks off of, off of the $500 before you. I'm just kidding. Everybody understands that, right? It's really funny. <laughs> yeah, don't, quit, don't quit your day job, Steve. Work-life balance. Work life balance, not a new term. It's kind of one of the term um, that's representative of what they would probably say the millennial generation, but the truth of the matter that the work-life balance term actually came about before the millennial term came about, and so now they're arguing about who came up with the term first. Uh, the truth is work-life balance is a term that is commonly used to describe the balance that a working individual needs between time allocated for work and other aspects of life. Areas of life other than work can and do include, but are not limited to, personal interests, faith, family, recreational, leisure activities, and so forth. And last week I added a definition to the work-life balance specifically to the term balance because I wanted to expand beyond a secular or a social or even a philosophical um, definition for the term work-life balance, I wanted to expand it to more of a threefold concept as opposed to work-life balance um, as, as a single concept. And here's, here's why I did that. I believe that balance is not simply that which is needed between work and life. But I, I believe that, that both work and life need to be significantly applied to the pursuit of balance. How many of you are tracking with me on that? Significant in the sense that work and life have no real meaning or purpose uh, without balance. And specifically, I'm speaking of a biblical balance, a biblical balance. I hope that you'll take a moment to make notations uh, of, of that term, biblical balance or uh, biblical viewpoint. Um, I believe that the Holy Spirit, as I said last week, is about to reveal uh, a truth to us regarding biblical balance that either some of us have forgotten or maybe some of us have never known before. Did you hear me on this? How many of you are ready for the Holy Spirit to reveal anything to you? Amen. Amen. But why don't we just ask Him to reveal to us an understanding of biblical balance so that it can really change our lives and really open up the doors to a dynamic faith and a walk of faith that maybe we possibly have never even experienced before. That's exciting. So whether you've either forgotten that truth or whether you've never fully understood or known it, I want you to reach for that. 
And I believe that God is wanting to speak to us during this uh, four or five week series uh, regarding balance. Work life can't be found or successfully done. Again, I'm saying to you, it can't be done without biblical balance. More accurately, work life can't be done without the Spirit and the presence, guidance, and the truth of God and His Word. Can you say amen? So, let's move on. I'm not going to go back and reteach last week. If you want to, uh, uh, to, to uh, listen either to watch or listen to last week's teaching, I would recommend it, especially if you're interested in finishing out the rest of this series with us. We said last week we committed ourselves to some scripture memorization. Does anybody remember that we were going to do some scripture memorization? I had someone come to me this week and said, hey, I'm having a hard time memorizing these scriptures, uh, these four scriptures. And I said, well, that's because there was three, not four. And then we also found out that in the conversation that, that, that those weren't the right scriptures. And this, he said, I said, well, let me hear what you got. And he started off, and he was really rolling. I go, yeah, that's awesome, but that, that's not the ones we're supposed to memorize. So if I had everyone like this gentleman who was in my office, if we were all on fire for God like this gentleman is, I'm going to tell you what, reunion would be off the charts. So, I'm excited. So, let's take a look at our scriptures, of uh, our memory scriptures from last week. What did I say? I said I would quote them and then you could lip sync. Did I say that? <laughs> our first one. Isaiah 26, 3, 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Hmm. Psalm 37, 23 through 24. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he stumbles, I love this, he will not fall on his face. That's worth reading again, is it not? Or that's worth quoting from memory again, is it not? The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he stumbles, he will not fall on his face, for the Lord upholds his hand. Hmm. Matthew 6, 31, 33. So do not be anxious, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles after all the, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And these are the foundational passages that we are going to use through this entire series. I'm asking you to learn them because next week we're going to quote them again. We're going to quote them without reading them. And we're, gonna, we're going to continue to quote them until they become a part of our heart. The Scripture says that we, the uh, Scripture says that His Word have I hid in my heart. Why? So that I might not sin against God. Powerful. We ever realized how powerful the Word is? What kind of a weapon we have with the Word of God? The Bible says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Work, responsibilities, remuneration, retirement. So we're moving forward in our teaching. Everybody awake. Say amen. So we're going to push through this. The practical essentials of work, the practical essentials of work are responsibilities. Say it with me. Responsibilities, remuneration, Retirement. It can be, and it is often said that there is, everybody, anybody ever heard this before? There's always work to be done, but not always jobs to do. There's always work to be done, but not always jobs to do. So I don't want anybody to get caught up today in semantics. 
you know. I'm going to clarify the context with which we're going to defi define the word work and the word job, okay? In a broader context, a broader context, they can be seen or defined as either the same or closely related. In fact, people interchange them. Going to work. If you're going to work, you're going to your job. I'm going to my job. What do you do there? I work. So we're not going to get caught in that broad idea because those words really are very, very closely related and people use them in the same context most frequently. However, I'm going to separate this out. I'm going to squeeze it down, compact it. I want to use a much more narrow context because what we're looking for is biblical, say it with me, biblical balance. We said that work or life really don't have any meaning unless they are supported, foundationalized, and led by biblical balance. We're never going to find fulfillment, meaning, purpose in work or life unless we can establish ourselves in a biblical balance. That's what we're reaching for. And so I'm going to close this context down, okay? In a narrower context, work and a job are distinctly different, and I'm going to define that for us in, in just a moment. Work-life balance, we're going to try to narrow our context regarding work every chance we get because it's going to help us, one, identify, and two, clarify our direction and our purpose for this teaching. For example, we will not define work as employment, as a contract, or a service agreement. In this more narrow and biblical context, that is considered a job, right? And we would not define work in this teaching as a shift, a, a part-time, full-time, work week, or career. That was a little bit awkward. I kind of stumbled over just that one word, so I'm going to try to take another whack at that. Can I do that? Are you, will you let me do that? Okay, I'm, here I go. You ready? We would not define work as a shift, part-time, full-time, work week, or career, okay? That, too, is more the same. It's the language of or related to having a job. And having a job is not a bad thing, can you say? Having a job is a good thing, especially if you're interested in paying your bills. Mm -hmm. So you might be surprised to understand today that the value meaning, and the outlook of work is drastically more complex, yet profoundly more simple. And that's a paradox. Are you listening to me? Okay? The meaning, the value, and the outlook of work is drastically more complex, yet profoundly more simple than just having a job. And that's not to demean the idea of having a job, it's to illustrate and illuminate the idea of work. Okay? I hope we can learn from this teaching that from a biblical and a philosophical viewpoint, having work or working is much more meaningful and fulfilling than simply having a job, an assignment, or a task. Now, we must process, I'm asking you, to process the idea of work through the balance of a biblical viewpoint. Back to that foundation of biblical balance. As we look at some of those complexities and simplicities, that biblical viewpoint of work becomes very, very clear for us. So I'm going to, I'm going to run through this. I'm going to give you some practical practical illustrations, definitions, sayings about work. And when I'm finished with those, I'm going to move right from that to a biblical definition, viewpoint, or truth about work. Everybody with me? I'm going to take, we're, going to, we're going to take off, and we're not going to land until we get, get finished here. I hear somebody just chuckling about that. I'm... I'm really never finished. I stop most Sundays, but I'm really never finished. So here are our practical, practical uh, ideas about work. Within most men and women, there is a need, 
and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to make sure I'm connecting with everybody. So here's what I'm going to do. If I say one of these things and it relates to you or connects with you, I just want you to raise your hand and put it back down so we can kind of see how people are tracking with me. Within most men and women, there is a need or desire or drive within them to accomplish and achieve. Anybody ever feel that drive or that desire in them to accomplish or achieve? Okay. There is a genuine sense of fulfillment and personal pride we all have in our good and hard work. Have you ever felt that? Wow, I just, I just, I just did a good job here. Okay. All right. Not all work is equal. There is difficult, hard, and dirty work. And other times there is monotonous, menial, and busy work. Depending on one's outlook and attitude, there is such a thing then as meaningful or meaningless work. Have you ever been caught in between one or the other? Have you ever looked up midway through your work career and thought, is this meaningful or is this meaningless? I may have a job, I may be paying my bills, I may be putting a little bit in savings, I may be taking care of the people that I love, this job affords that great blessing, but my work, my work, is my work meaningful or is it meaningless? We should do meaningful work. I got no hands on that one. Maybe I should have said, we should do meaningless work. It's five o'clock somewhere. Here's the truth. We should do meaningful work. Amen. Amen. Some people are motivated by the encouragement of reward or recognition for good work, and others are not. Some people are motivated by the fear of of deductions and layoffs for poor and unacceptable work, and others are not. Some people go to work in fear of losing their job. The psychological and emotional impacts of having work and not having work are real and significant. The psychological and emotional impacts of having work or not having work are real and significant. Personal security identity, and self-worth are attached to the achievement and fulfillment of our work. All right. Personal security, identity, self-worth are attached to the achievement and fulfillment of our work. For the person who has their work, remuneration isn't always about money. I don't see anybody raising their hand, but I see people shaking their head. And I think, some, I, th I think some people are just looking at me and saying, don't even kid yourself, Steve. It's all about the money. <laughs> right. Okay. That was a little aggressive. <laughs> For the person who only has a job, the remuneration that matters is money. Work will always lead us to a job, but a job will not always lead us to our work. We should work our job, but our job should never work us. All right. I think we've laid a pretty good practical foundation. Everybody find something in there that you could connect to or relate to that was work or job related. Did it clarify some of what we're trying to talk about, this difference or this distinction between work and job. Anybody there? So let's see what God's Word does for us, okay? Hopefully it changes your heart like it changes mine. Biblical, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands, Psalm 97. Read it with me. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Hmm. I don't know how many people we actually have here who get up in the morning and you go out and work your land, but you understand that's a metaphor or an illustration for people who are working their work or doing their job. 
Whoever works their land, whoever pours themselves into his or her work, pours themselves into his or her work will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. The Scripture also says to us that, that, hey, he has never seen the righteous begging for bread, right? If we're going to give our very best, God, and we honor God in all that we do, we are going to be blessed. Commit your work to the Lord. Read it with me. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Proverbs 16, 3. Have you committed your work to God? It's a question. Have you committed your work to God? And are you talking about your job or are you talking about your work? He didn't say commit your job. He said commit your work. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs 16.3. Some people wonder why their plans never work out. It's, it's, it's okay. I'm not awkward with the silence. I'm good. Some people wonder. I've had people ask me, Pastor Steve, it just doesn't ever seem to work out for me. It's not working. No matter what I plan, no matter what I put together, it just doesn't seem to work. The first thing I would have to ask is, have you committed your work to the Lord? Okay. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men, Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. What's the verse talking about here? The wisest man who ever lived said. What did he say? He said, do you see a skillful man? Do you see a skillful man in his work? He will stand before kings. He will never stand before obscure and meaningless people. Do you want to do something that has meaning or purpose to it? Then honor God with your work. Commit your work to God. Do you see a skillful man in his work? Become good at your work. Don't just get by. Are you with me today? Some of us are just getting by with our work. We do our job, but your work is important. Does it have meaning or is it meaningless? The reason why we can't find balance in work-life balance is because we don't have a biblical view a biblical foundation, a biblical balance in our life, and so our work is as meaningful as a job. You show up 15, 20, 30 minutes late. Why are you late again? Well, I don't know. I quit. I'm just going to get another job. A person like that doesn't have any work. They'll get another meaningless job. Are you listening to me? They will get another job that's, well, not totally meaningless, but in terms of work, in terms of pouring themselves into, they will get another job. But work only comes around a few times in a lifetime. Can you, under, can you understand what I'm saying? Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal, John 6, 27. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work, John 9, 4. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, Romans 15, 17. Are you still awake? Whatever you do... Read it with me. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, Colossians 3.23. Understand this. You do a job for men, for a man, for an employer, but your work is done for God. We have lost meaning in the workplace because people do not work for God. They work for themselves. They do a job for a man, for a company. And you should. 
You should, and you should do a good job, and you should uh, be a good employee. But I'm telling you right now, you're not working as a believer and a follower in Christ. A biblical balance to your life is this. I'm not working for the man. I'm working for God, the Creator, who breathed the breath of life into me and gave me meaning and purpose. He knows, he knew that before I was 40 years old, I wouldn't have another hair on my head. And he had already counted them. Everybody still with me? Say amen. Before, when I was in my mother's womb, do you understand? He has known me from the beginning of time. He created me. He created in me. He breathed the breath of life in me. My work is for my creator. My work is not for men. My work is not for a paycheck. My work is for the great reward. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you Lord over many things. We're seeking, we are reaching for, we are working for something bigger, more meaningful than temporal things here on earth. Can you say amen? I'm looking for your support today. I don't need you to always agree with me, but I need you to support the Word of God. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Do you want to do good work? Crickets? Do you want to do good work? Uh, do you want to do good work? <laughs> yes, okay. If you want to do good work, then you need to understand that the Word of God, the Scripture that is breathed out by God, is profitable to you. Everything in God's Word is for you. It's not always about you, but every word in that book is for you. It's there so that you can be taught. It's there so that you can profit. It's there so that you can be corrected. You ever heard of the term self-correct? You know where that came from? That's not really a pop psych psychology social, social uh, term, counseling term. Self-correct. Okay. That's a biblical term. It's called the Holy Spirit convicting your heart. Self-correct. It's called God speaking to you and saying, no, stop. You're doing the wrong thing. You're going the wrong way. That's a God term. Biblical balance will teach you that term is from God. Self-correct. How do I self-correct? I listen to the Holy Spirit, God speaking to me, challenging me. You think so, Steve? Yeah, I think so. Really, why do you think so? This is not me having a conversation with me. Roses are red, violets are blue, I'm schizophrenic, and so am I. This is not me having a conversation with me. This is God speaking to me. It's His Holy Spirit at work in me, giving me insight, challenging me. I have a strong personality. It isn't just, my personality isn't just, you know, experienced by all of you and all of my family. My strong personality, hey, God made me that way. But because He made me that way, He knows how to deal with me. When my strong personality challenges God, the Holy Spirit says to me, Steve, stop. Don't even kid yourself. I know you. You, 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 you. Without me, you're a loser. Do you know that I've understood that? In him, I win. Without him, I'm, I'm just another loser. Okay, some of you are going to you know, wrestle with that and go, what are you calling me? What are you saying? What are you saying? Just what I said. In Christ, we win. Without him, we're a loser. If you think that's not true, you're living it. You're living it. Everybody still loves me. Amen. This side a little more, this side not so much. <laughs> Feel a lot of love over here. Over here it's just kind of like eh, ambivalence. Is it time to eat the Mexican food yet? <laughs> that's what I get from over here. It's like the Israelites grumbling in the desert. Manna again. All right, let's move on. <laughs> for, I <am> already, <laughs> for I am already, for I am already, for 
For I am already poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought. Who do, who do you think is saying this? Paul, the apostle. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. The end of his life. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What's he talking about? He's talking about the good work that he has done. And because of that good work, he has been able to finish his race without regret, without remorse, with his head held up high in faith. Can you say amen? The conclusion of our work is about achievement and enjoyment. Sometimes it's hard to enjoy a job. Sometimes it's hard to enjoy a job. But if you approach your job as your work, you approach your job with the goal of achieving and enjoying what you do as to the Lord and not to men. Have we learned anything from God's Word today? Yeah. The two conclusive concepts, achievement and enjoyment, always go together. Black peas and carrots, Mama always says. By that I mean you cannot find fulfillment out of achieving something if you did not enjoy it. And you cannot enjoy doing something if you do not accomplish anything. Is everybody tracking with that? Cannot find fulfillment out of achieving something if you did not enjoy it. And you cannot enjoy doing something if you do not accomplish anything. Have you ever left your job and thought, what did I do today? What did I get done today? So I see a lot of people getting paid an hourly wage and spending at least 30, 40% of their work day on social media. And they wonder why life, work, have no balance. Biblical balance is what we seek. Biblical balance provides meaning and value to our work. It provides balance to our work that even time management can't provide for us. You ever heard that practical suggestion? You know, your work, your job, those things can mean more to you if you can manage your time just a little bit better. I'm telling you that biblical balance will provide meaning and value to your work even more so than your time management. Time management's a good thing. When our work has this kind of meaning, then we know we have achieved something of great value. I was just looking over here uh, in the corner, and I was looking at global missions, knowing that there are people who have been working towards a goal. We are heading to Zimbabwe on the 30th of May, to Harare. This is a city, this is a rural city, a huge, huge city that just a couple of months ago was ravaged by cyclones, and there are people living in shelters all over that city. They don't have enough antibiotics to even keep people alive from just cuts. People get a cut in their leg, their arm, they're getting infected. The water is not being able to be purified, okay? We are not going to be able to go over there and fix every problem in Harare, Zimbabwe. But we are going over there to do a work that will last forever in God's kingdom. And in the process, we're going to do something. There are people who are working towards that mission. That's going to mean something to them and mean something to God. Can you say amen? And maybe not, so some, not something so far away, but I look away, away from the global mission sign, and I look up there and I see our little uh, graces. It's starting to look like one of those, you know, Jimmy Buffett shacks over there in the corner. It's kind of cool. But I want to tell you, there are two men who sit in this worship room every Sunday who have taken upon themselves to take this room 
and to make it into something special and beautiful for all of us to worship Him. They show up here as volunteers. They're not looking for remuneration. The remuneration that they get for this is the joy that they see on your faces when you worship God every Sunday. You know, we started out maybe six months ago this past year. The church building in here was school bus yellow. We didn't know whether we were going to worship God or whether we were waiting for our bus. You know what to do. But slowly by slowly, we had, you know, uh, one of our elders who is a, a brilliant designer and has such a great eye for those things. He, he, he picked out this uh, taupe color, and he said, no, nope, this is the color. It's going to look great. And we put, painted the whole walls in here, all this taupe. You should have heard people. You, you would have thought that, you know, we were, you know, out in the desert and we needed to head back to Egypt. You have brought us out here in the desert to die, you know. This looks like a prison. How many of you have heard some of the grumblings from, you know, from folks? I mean, there it was. But yet, by the time these two gentlemen stepped alongside that taupe color, and they began to put this, this wood, this reclaimed wood. This is not fake or faux wood. This is real, real reclaimed wood. They began to cut these pieces and fill them in and put them around the walls. And this past week, a little vision that one of our elders had for graces with the little covering over it. And it's not finished, but it's something. It's work. It's God's work. It means something. It's not meaningless. It's meaningful. I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed by it because I see both of them wearing Band-Aids on their fingers. They, you know, and if they had to put, those, put that up there with wood studs, they probably, neither one of them would have cuts, but they decided they wanted to do it with that light metal, which was a smart decision, but because of it, that metal is as sharp as a razor blade. Both of them cut their fingers. Yesterday, the people who came and sat up and worked, there were chandeliers hanging from places around here, and, and uh, there were moms and daughters being blessed. And then when all the activity and all the beauty of the, you know, daughter of the king ball was over, there's the people who show up, who clean up, who put the chairs back. Nobody notices. The video cameras aren't going. We're not live streaming set up. Join us for our live streaming. We're going to be tearing down, cleaning, and setting up the church again. Nobody's there for that. Is that a job or is that work? It's work. It's meaningful work because it makes a difference. It blesses people's lives. We showed up today. They asked me, what do you think about the chairs? You know, because everybody assumes that everything flows through me, and if one chair's out of place, I'm not going to like it. And... And that's, that's kind of true. I sense rebellion. But I looked out there and I said, it's awesome. It's, 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 it's beautiful. I said, there will be people who will sit at the tables. Yeah, they're just going to defy you. But nonetheless, we're going to have a wonderful celebration. Can you hear this word today that I've shared with you on work? Okay. What did we get from this? Anybody, real quick. Something that the Lord spoke to your heart. Something that jumped off the page and into your heart today. Real quick. Doing it for the Lord. Anybody else? Value of work. Yes. Anybody else? Real. Sense of accomplishment, achievement. Anybody else? Pardon? Helping others. Part of our job. Part of our work. Not our job, but our work. Excuse me. Anybody else? A closing one. Selfless, what? Selflessness. Thank you. There it is. Meaningful things. Not wasting our time on meaningless things. I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions here. Can you distinguish between your job and your work? If you can, raise your hand. What is your work? Do you know? Have you been able to identify your work? Not your job, your work. Are you passionate and caring about your work? Okay. Does your work bring you or others enjoyment? If not, what can you do to change it? Is your work biblically balanced? And is this the work that you should be doing? 
If not, what work would you do if you could do anything you wanted to do? If you could do anything, any work, okay? Some people are saying nothing. I would like to work at nothing. Thanks for sharing that. Are you satisfied with the remuneration for your work? You're never going to be satisfied with the money you get. But remuneration becomes more than money when we have a work to do. Can you say amen? Do you see yourself ever retiring from your work? I think from is misspelled, and that's on me. Okay. Do you see yourself ever retiring from your work? And I guess if you do, then my question is, what are you going to do then? You know, I had a friend that I went to college with, and uh, of course I maintained those relationships through the lovely and wonderful opportunity of social media. It's a, it's a blessing. But I noticed that they were retiring from their work, and they work at Ole Miss in Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. And they've been there for actually 33, 34 years. And I was just thinking they were having this re retirement party for, for her. And uh, I was thinking, with, and there was all these young people that just adored her. She was, uh, she was just, she's just a person with a personality that draws and attracts young people. And they're always around her, always. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of people, hundreds of people who were sending well wishes to her about her retirement, all from the university there. And I was thinking, you're retiring, but what are you going to do now? What's going to replace all that life and all that meaning? How many of you are listening to me right now? If you have work that has meaning, Scripture says to us that only what we do for Christ is going to last in the end. That's meaningful work. Can I pray for you today? Lord, I'm just praying for everyone who's gathered here at Reunion today and praying for a, just an understanding and a revelation of this idea of work. I hope that this has not been confusing to anyone, but I pray that you would take those confusing things that come out of my mouth and that you would, by the time it gets to their ears, help them to have an understanding. The distinction between life work and the job, though both important, one seems to have eternal consequences. I pray, Father, that you would help us to see and understand the eternal consequences that lie there in wait for us. I pray that our work would continue to bring life to us and not death. I pray that our work would continue to provide meaning, meaning and purpose for us and not hopelessness or meaninglessness that we would look up and see that we are doing something that makes a difference in your kingdom and for the people that we love most in this life. Let our work be an inspiration. Let our work represent the truth. Let our work bring hope. Let our work change people's lives. Let our work change our lives. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise today. Hey, listen. I, don't, I hope that you don't feel the need to rush out because there's plenty of food for everybody. I'd love you to stay around. Um, we got a uh, wonderful video to show uh, from the past 20 years, you know, and, uh, you know, we didn't really make a concentrated effort on reaching out 
uh, to a lot of people from the past. Some of our people from the past are uh, no longer with us. Mike's going to MC and he's going to take us down a really neat journey today. Um, of course, not everybody could be here, but you're here today. And maybe you've only been at reunion for a short time. And to you, I would say, it would be worthwhile staying, getting a free meal, good food, and finding out who these crazy people are that you're getting ready to connect to, right? Because we're really praying that reunion would become your home church and that we would become your people. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So this is an opportunity for you to get to know us. And I guess the only thing I have left to do is to invite you to join me on Wednesday for an amazing apologetics class called I Apologize. Last week, we actually got a text from someone in class that said, I apologize for not being able to be there tonight. Um, but this is a wonderful apologetics class that's written and being taught by one of our assistant pastors, Todd Bookout, and I think that this is a worthwhile class. I think you would love Love, love, love being a part of our, what's going on there on Wednesday nights. Of course, we always have our Wednesday Bible class taught by one of our elders, Charles Kasky, and that is a wonderful constant that we provide and offer people uh, on Wednesdays as well. Love to see you out here. Love to see you involved. Uh, on the 19th, everybody say the 19th. the 19th. We are going to be celebrating part of uh, our 20 years with 20 years of worship music at Reunion. Uh, reunion Worship Band, uh, I know they're a team, okay, but aren't we called, aren't we the re Reunion Worship Band? That's what I thought. It's on our website. I just believe stuff that's on the website. Um, um, the, the worship team, re worship band, is going to be celebrating 20 years of worship music, uh, going back and, and uh, bringing some of the songs that we had from, the, maybe not all of them are worth singing, but... Um, <laughs> But a few of the ones that really stuck with us, we're going to kind of take us down through. It's going to be a wonderful evening, uh, 90 minutes of great celebration with some of the folks who've been leading worship here for the whole 20 years, Bradford. And I, th yes, yes, I think he deserves a bigger hand than that one right now, I can tell you that much. Yeah. So I guess the only thing to, left to do is to sing the reunion song and then eat. Is that correct? And pray. And pray. <laughs> Over the food. Okay. Can I get a, a chair? Can somebody bring me a stool? There's maybe some, there's a stool in the back. Just bring me a stool from the back. That'll be good. We probably ought to just turn the live video streaming off. That's a good way to end it. Thank you, Larry. I do appreciate that. I think I'm going to take that stool, though. After all that trouble, he almost killed himself getting that up here. I know. Hey, you know the two guys that I told you that did all the work around here? Well, that's one of them. That's Larry LaPrairie and that's Eddie Cepeda. And I just want to thank those guys. Hey, this is a, uh, this is a gift from the uh, board and the elders for you. Envy. For me, Envy or me? I think it's just you, Envy. Okay. So... <laughs> a voice from the back yeah. and uh, let's pray over the food mm -hmm. uh, and let's let um, our pastor and his wife uh, be the first in line because I know how this group gets it gets like a herd over there so, Father we just thank you for the blessing of reunion what you have given us the pastor you have given us the pastors you have given us as this song tells us, the people that have come and the people that have gone, the people that are here, and the blessings that you have given us. Bless this food to our body. Bless this congregation to our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This long and winding road is our journey towards home. Walking by ourselves is not how it should be done. I always have this hard time getting there. <laughs> we pray for those who said they'd go, but they found they could not stay. Is that the second verse? That's the second verse. 
I wrote this song. Let's start again. This long and winding, Brad, are you there? Do you know the words? Is our journey towards home. And walking by ourselves is not how it should be done. So we seek a kindred soul And those with heavy load We look into their eyes and we say I will be walking with you You will be walking with me For the Lord has called us now to be together, and if our lives bring us joy or sorrow tomorrow, I will be walking with you, you will be walking with me, loving you and loving him forever. This is the verse. Looking at the paths we've chose has not always been safe. We've only come this far because we've learned your ways. We pray for those who said they go, but they found they could not stay. With grace and love, embrace those who remain. I will be walking with you. You will be walking with me. For the Lord has called us now to be together. And if our lives bring us joy, or sorrow tomorrow I will be walking with you you will be walking with me I will be walking with you you will be walking with me one more I will be walking with you you will be walking with me, loving you and loving him forever. Blessings.